focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Forbes India, influencers of change, in partnership with UiPath. As Industrial Revolution 4.0 progresses to the age of automation, this union of human and digital ingenuity has the power to achieve breakthroughs for problems of today and tomorrow. But influencing such a change for the greater good requires leadership that stands for empowerment rather than entrenchment and collaboration rather than compartmentalization. As the pandemic accelerates a transition to a virtual engagement between employees, suppliers, vendors and customers, managing this radical change to create an organic ecosystem where everyone wins is what will separate the leaders from managers. To profile these lessons in excellence, we bring to you this special presentation titled Forbes India, Influencers of Change in Partnership with UiPath. I'm your host Gautam Srinivasan and joining me is a panel of leaders who will share their experiences and insights on innovating the right way for the future. Let me quickly introduce them to you starting with Tapan Singhal, MD and CEO at Bajaj Allianz General Insurance, one of India's largest private insurers. Rama Mohan Rao, MD and CEO at SBI Card which ranks among India's largest credit card issuers. Rick Harshman, SVP and MD for Asia Pacific and Japan at UiPath, the global industry leader for automation platforms. And joining Rick is Anil Bhaseen, MD and VP for India and South Asia at UiPath. Thank you everyone for joining in. Now let's approach this discussion from three angles, influence, instrument and inspire. Let's start with influencing the change and this is a question I'll address to Tampan, Rama and Rick and see how we move from there. How do you think leaders in an organization should demonstrate true ownership and commitment to making changes happen as any transformation passes through the phases of discovery, building, management, implementation and engagement? Tapan, we'll start with you first. Thank you, Gautam. I think it's a very interesting question. See, first and foremost, my belief is that leaders should not be swayed by what is the uh, so-called fancy words and jargons you know, being thrown around everywhere. I think they should be first and foremost clear about why they want a transformation. What is the purpose of it and what will it lead to and why should do so? Once they are clear and they are convinced and they have a discussion with the senior leadership and once the common vision comes in, I think that is when the transformation gets into a hyperspace and moves very, very fast because people are excited to make the difference to the consumer or to the society or to the world or to the country. There's something which they want to achieve. It is just not about you know, doing business in a way that it gets you an incremental growth or something which is there. It's not about just doing fancy things because it sounds good when you present it to a board meeting. And that is how you know, leaders have to be very, very, very clear themselves and very convince themselves as to what will it serve when they go through this transformation process. Absolutely. Right off the bat, a very good point understand why you want to change rather than following the pack and trying to change because they have rama your views on this i think while as a digital company we always uh, have the pressures to look at immediate quarters uh, i think as a leader one needs to look at the ecosystem changes uh, which may be disrupting the business model but in a very very subtle way may not be uh, palpable from quarter to quarter understand and provide a kind of uh, insights into it and then discuss with the uh, senior management uh, and uh, make it as a kind, kind of uh, organizational, make it part of the application efforts. Uh, I mean, of course, you have to align all the stakeholders, so senior management and the teams all together, uh, then the daily will be all right. And Rick, as someone who enables change for a whole lot of companies in terms of innovating for the future, what's your view on this question of how leaders in an organization have to demonstrate true ownership and commitment to making changes happen? Well, it's a great question. You know, one of the axioms within the UiPath team is that change is the oxygen that we breathe, which I boil down to change is going to happen. It's how we as leaders help our teams through this change, you know, internally or externally, how we articulate the vision, the mission, and then the execution behind that change. And quite frankly, and more broadly, I believe that it is the responsibility of leaders to see ahead of the curve and to provide guidance to their teams. 
Now, the, the pace of change has accelerated, and the role to simplify the complexity around our teams is more important than ever before. I believe that the, the board and the C-suite must demonstrate the conviction along with the commitment to see the strategic transformation through. All right, let's see how in terms of managing risks and ensuring business continuity, the broader landscape itself has changed with the onset of the pandemic. Uh, Anil, if you could uh, if you could jump right in on this question, you know, how has digitalization helped enterprises build more resilience from a strategic perspective? I'll come to you for the broader point and then I'll come to Tapan and Rama for specific instances. Gautam, first of all, thank you for that question. You know, I think this pandemic, uh, and nobody envisaged this completely. I mean, this is, we've kind of morphed from a very digital world, uh, sorry, to a, uh, from a very physical world to a digital world. So the pandemic has really taught us the criticality of maintaining business continuity of operations with manual handoffs, right? Even traditional businesses, if you take just the traditional businesses, they've catalyzed their complete technology adoption. So I think COVID has actually acted as a great catalyst and it has made uh, you know this a boardroom priority. Uh, I was reading some statistics. So economic uh, intelligence unit research says 93% of C-level executives see that RPS kick started their digital transformation, right? And as per Forrester, the future of work survey, around 82% of executives expect automation uh, and acceleration over the next three months. This is how quick. So I think it is just about making sure that we've got the priority right. Uh, everybody is talking of digital transformation. The question is, how do we become a catalyst to, to change? I think that's something that UiPath is very keen and, and that's what we are doing, partnering with our customers across the globe. All right, uh, Rama, coming to you broadly in terms of the payments landscape, you know, and as I mentioned, managing risks and ensuring business continuity, how has the broader landscape changed? I completely echo Anil's view. Uh, I mean, typically a business continuity plan is more around whether your assistance will be available, whether we have a backup or not. But this pandemic has really exposed whether we are prepared for a situation where people are not able to reach out to offices because of restrictions. A case in point, let's like say, you know, we as an organization survive on call centers, uh, you know, people taking care of operations, etc. Uh, but for the first time, when people were not able to reach offices, obviously we had to provide them with a laptops, with VPN, provide them with cloud based guidelines, etc. Uh, which took some time, uh, but we were much better than uh, many organizations. But during the second period, with the benefit of the, uh, our preparation and the end of uh, it was what we have seen in the first way, we were much better prepared. In fact, uh, at the first warning signal from the ground level, we were able to invoke the business continuity. We were able to provide around 2,400 laptops to our uh, uh, offer portals in full uh, time manpower. And uh, we have an inbuilt internal capacity to tap it to almost 5,000 kind of uh, VPN access for them. We even enable the vendors to permit their employees to work from home uh, with a proper technology, with the cloud based with the InfoSec requirements to be taken care of. So uh, I can, uh, cannot overemphasize the importance of continuing the uh, operations, particularly when people are working from home, but at the same time taking care of the InfoSec. All right. So it is a, it is an end to end initiative when it comes to taking care of vendors, employees and of course the customers. It has to all come in together. Let's get in Tapan's views on this. Tapan, if from the insurance industry perspective, how has the broader landscape changed uh, when it comes to managing risks and ensuring business continuity? What's been your experience? Uh, Gautam, so you will find it very interesting and funny. Yeah. Insurance typically, you know, it's 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 a it's a conversational sale. Uh, there has been attempts, you no, know, to have a direct to customer, and some companies are trying, but uh, nowhere do we have a very big scale of success in that. Still, a conversational sale, which means that it's a very distribution-driven um, organization. So, in a pandemic, now that is a problem. You, you you're not meeting people. Yeah, first problem. The second is if you again look at it. And it's pretty interesting. I've been investing a lot in um, no, tech and trying to you know, automate as much as possible. But still, we had a lot of paper. You know? And I was pretty disappointed with myself. And I, I remember I'd gone to Singapore before the pandemic. And I realized that Singapore also, a digitally very advanced country, 95% of insurance work is still on paper. And I used to think, oh my God, this is not going to improve. And when COVID happened, I think one of the reasons for regulations, you had to send paper documents. You know? When COVID happened, 
right through regulator to everybody, you know, enable the automation. And as a company like ours, which was ahead in automation curve, it was such a smooth process. You'll be surprised to hear that we issued close to 20 million policies straight through, you know, and we settled close to about um, three to four million claims, you know, straight through without documents, without papers in terms of uh, physical papers and physical documents, but all automated, all digital. And it was such a smooth transition that my grievance ratio dropped by 90%, you know, in terms of the grievances which I used to have, it became uh, so good. So I think automation was there, uh, regulation enablement happened, uh, the customers uh, adopted, and the, even the distributors adopted at a very hyper speed. And I don't think I will take credit of it as a leader, as a company. I think people are used to automation now. They're used to the WhatsApps, Facebooks, you know, the Twitter, LinkedIn's of the world. So they know how to handle uh, a smartphone. They know how to handle, you no know, uh, in terms of uh, processes and that. So that customer transformation had happened. Companies are ready for it. Right time, regulations in environment, it just zoomed to the next level. So for me, it was a very, very interesting experience. So the transition was smooth. Anil, coming to you, does that surprise you? I mean, co considering it was such a black swan event and it was so sudden, uh, does the smoothness in the transition from what we have heard uh, from both Tapan and Rama, does it surprise you? No, not really. In fact, I will tell you that, you know, this is again a lot of uh, learning curve that we ourselves have seen is just taking Tapan's point ahead. I think from an automation and insurance perspective, we've seen a lot of insurance companies talk to us about, uh, you know, how to kind of settle claims, you know, this this high value opportunity about claim settlement, fraud detection, assessment. Uh, we've seen conversations around policy admin servicing, you know, policy issuance, for example, how do we make the customer experience seamless? Uh, you know, just the renewable reminders on sales, on distribution, on FNA, reporting, audit, uh, I, and I can go on and on. I think the success stories that we've seen are really across the automation uh, you know, areas in the insurance industry that we are talking about. And it is only accelerated pace. We are talking about business outcomes such as lower operational costs. A lot of mm. people talk about productivity, efficiency, right? But improved customer experience is something that I've seen off late as a big conversation. It's not just the backend automation people are talking about, right? Things like how do we increase our NPS by two to four points, right? Obviously, compliance, it's it's 100% compliance, so that that is zero tolerance. So I am personally seeing a more business outcome driven approach that automation is talking about rather than just being a tactical necessity at a technology layer. And I've also heard of, you know, chatbots having an empathy factor so that they are more human like in their interaction. So the possibilities, this is just, a, you know, a start of where we are and you may just scratch the surface. But I dial back to the point and I'll ask this to you, Tapan, your transition was smooth. But what would be your advice to others? You know, digitization itself poses new and meaningful disruptions to organizational change amid challenges connected with, say, the scope and scale of the transformation, sourcing new skill sets and resources, and finding new approaches to assessment. So as a leader, how do you ensure your transformation efforts succeed in addressing these challenges? So we heard Rick uh, mention before, no? he said leaders should be able to see ahead of the curve. So let me talk about two, three things which I'm you know, very, very passionate about. One, I believe is the space of technological advancement is at such a hyper speed that the human brain is not able to comprehend how fast this will happen. If you don't believe me, let me take you back 10, 15 years back and ask you, did you ever comprehend that we'll be at this kind of stage right now? No. In fact, when I used to speak about electric vehicle about four years back, nobody believed that it will come at such a hyper speed, no, where it is today. In terms of people are still disbelieving. Or I talk of computational scales, or look at internet uh, reach, you know, in India it's reached to villages, you know, and, and the kind of investment which has happened. The speed at which technological advancement happens is very high. A leader, if you have a problem, and if your technology is ready today, and you're able to predict that by the time I'm able to reach here and start using the tools to build that, and the cusp happens, that is where the magic happens. No, So I think first and foremost, let me say, why could we have such a smooth transition? If I look at insurance, the biggest problem in insurance has been the customer dissatisfaction. And broadly across the world, people feel insurance is a very cumbersome process. A lot of you know, fine lines, fine prints, and nothing from customer delight perspective. Well, the reality is all this happens because of manual intervention. You know, because all the documentation we ask for. And today's time, when you have so much data which is digitally available, and you can just you know, plug and play and get all those details, why should you require such a kind of intervention? So I think in 2014, I told my team, 
we should be setting retail claims within uh, 10 minutes time we should be setting automobile claims on the spot no today you hear about quite a few companies doing that at that time people said the cameras were not good you you laugh at it those time 2014 it's not very far back uh, the cameras on the on the on the so called uh, digital pads were not very effective and you could not take pictures which were very clearly they were cumbersome the net was not very good and people said it just doesn't work we'll require people to go we can automate at the back end but not in the front end i said let's let's make an effort my bet is by time we are ready with all the uh, programming and you know, getting it ready we should be there and actually it happened and we were the first among the world to do so actually you know uh, settle claims on the spot uh, not only for um, automobile for mobile phones for you just name it matlab uh, all retail claims within 10 minutes with the least of you no know, hassle for the customer the customer experience has changed to the next level you no know, gautam i think that is when we are so obsolete and so passionate and so you no know, convinced that we will redefine the industry that we embarked on this journey and when covid happened we were actually ready with so much stuff that for the transition we are very smooth so to answer your question as a leader if you're not so passionate about industry you don't want to redefine it re change it and not thinking what are the pain points for the consumer and how do you put it once you even put it all together i think it's is magic it it happens very very smoothly so but that that's the challenge a leader has to face and uh, embark on this journey and do absolutely. it very smoothly absolutely absolutely it looks like passion is the fuel which takes you from that first step which you take which requires a lot of courage to the end point that you reach and uh, i guess listening to your experience uh, you are enca encapsulating the saying of you know some look at things that say why i guess you looked at things and said why not but uh, coming back to uh, to the question of how do you preempt that impact of volatility rama i'll come to you you mentioned you had systems in place already before the pandemic hit as a leader how would you influencing how would you influence the think thinking around preempting the impact of volatility especially if the nature of disruption is long term in nature such as say the pandemic versus short term disruption such as gst or demonetization i think uh, now the matter is start with a very more uh, I mean, more relevant example for a credit card industry where the collections is the uh, mm. most important part of the life cycle of a card customer it starts with the sourcing it starts with the onboarding a customer Uh, then of course you use the uh, uh, all the digital means that are available to engage with the customer in terms of providing the right experience. You also provide the right platforms, whether it is a chatbot or whether it is a mobile app, uh, etc. In terms of engaging with the customer and providing a self-service kind of uh, chat. Uh, but the last piece, the most important piece of the collection, where we always used to depend on either uh, telephone centers or otherwise field teams who used to call on the delinquent customers for recovery of money. But during pandemic, it so happened that actually when the restrictions were there, we were not able to employ the field team. And uh, the penny calling also has its limitations in the sense, you know, like, after one or two calls, there is a possibility that the customer may not be taking the call at all. For various reasons, maybe for the immune reason also. Um, maybe it's uh, uh, a separate. Uh, but then we realized that unless we have a collection ecosystem also, if we don't digitize the entire ecosystem, Uh, who will be missing the bus? And particularly, it may have impact on the bottom line. It may have uh, impact on the uh, key metrics. So we digitized the entire collection ecosystem. Where we were even uh, using the data analytics, we were able to segment the customers who are likely to pay, who are actually whose behavior uh, with competition is already uh, exhibiting some kind of stress. Where we may have to offer settlement, uh, which typically used to be kind of negotiation process with the field team calling on the customer, assessing the customer, the uh, ability to pay, all the a very intense negotiation we reduced it to a kind of uh, directly making an offer through the digital means where with the help of a couple of clicks the customer will be able to book pay the settlement and he will be able to pay this debt so as i said this volatility we were seeing in two fronts particularly in terms of sourcing also we were seeing the uh, huge volatility because a lot of our sourcing is also through the bank branches and if the bank branches are not operational and if the customers are not visiting the branches then obviously it will impact the sourcing And similarly, if the locations were typically like a premier uh, shopping malls, etc., where we or extended their workforce operate in terms of sourcing, if they are not available, obviously uh, they will come into play. So we, uh, I mean, uh, as in the development relating to the sourcing, we created a complete end-to-end -end digital channel uh, whereby the customer is able to uh, find an application. And again, as uh, Tapan has also said, a kind of straight-through process where the risky solutions also have been digitized completely to. Uh, a kind of autonomous decision. Okay. In fact, 60% of my throughput in terms of applications are actually decisioned automatically through a risk engine to a rule set. So that is the kind of uh, automation and digitization work we have in this company. And uh, 
the credit of pandemic we expected certain developments which otherwise would have happened maybe after the year all right so that's your use case when it comes to preempting volatility even if it's long term in uh, nature let's uh, wrap up this segment around influencing the change with a question to both uh, rick and anil looking at the range of business problems which can be solved with this marriage of intelligent automation and artificial intelligence how do you see this phenomenon influencing change for enterprises considering the bandwidth that it leaves leaders free do you think we are entering the era of de-headquarterization rick you could go first and then we'll come to anil it's an interesting question uh especially when you see how many large companies are talking about you know being able to work uh you know wherever you'd like and you know hybrid workforces and things like that but you know i think it's important to take a step back when answering a, a question like this and and really just you know admit that the complexity of running a business successfully has increased by many multiples you know top and i were talking offline we've known each other for more than a decade when we were just starting when i was starting out in cloud where you was talking about earlier about the pace of change if you were to talk about a decade ago you know how pervasive a cloud would be today in the early 2020s i think there would be a lot of skepticism and that's one of the one of the reasons with cloud and then automation why this is taking off is because of the complexity of running a business successfully has increased by so many multiples you've got ever ever shorter cycles of change there's geopolitical developments that are impacting how businesses are run there's sustainability factors there's increasing levels of regulations and this has led to a multiplication of processes within and ex- internally and externally within businesses that are required to operationally manage an organization today and if you're a ceo it becomes even more complex so automation in our mind combined with ai and ml forms an end-to-end intelligent automation platform that helps manage these processes more effectively and efficiently now automation improves productivity and allows ceos and the c-suite to spend their time where it really matters and that's with their customers their partners and employees and you're hearing that with our guests today when they talk about improving net promoter scores including uh, better uh, customer experience and the like and that's really where the rubber meets the road with automation all right anil your view yeah i think in terms of complexity you know gotham it's interesting nothing is on their network anymore right your applications which are going multifold are off your network right your network is off your network because now you have the cloud your users are there off your network I think the one thing uh, today that I think is a non-negotiable is how do you make businesses much more agile to a point where the businesses actually touch the customers and real product or service uh, experience delivered on the ground, right? Which basically means that we have now to kind of uh, develop a centralized long-term strategy, which is combined with a hyper-localized approach, right? For each market. So markets are different. and today i think the mantra is anything that is automatable should be automated right mm-hmm. i think like tapan said the gap between technology evolution and human evolution is is such a high gap that the only way to bridge that is bring in automation uh, which kind of works as a partner to the humans that are there and hoping to uh, make sure that we drive in more efficiencies through the work that they do get them out of mundane repetitive tasks right and make sure that we are lo- using data analytics and insights right at every available point uh, so that you know we make this a very seamless operation uh, i think it's really about putting people back into what i call as high grade work and then taking the mundane activity the, the what i think is uh, non intelligent activity out of their daily profile almost uh, you know instantaneously uh, hmm. because there is uh, too much of applications there are too many transactions there are too many processes that is why you need analysis you need analytics right so i think we need to just frame the equation saying that can we create an interface like an automation between the end user and the application where they kind of subtract all the intelligence bring it down to a level present the data in a very seamless fashion i'll give a simple example think of a contact center agent right he can pull in data from multiple sources just delivering on the customer experience and he can say okay i've got the full life cycle of this customer uh, regardless of whatever the point of sale was and now that i know i can kind of predict what i can sell to him or drive a better customer experience based on the pain points he's come across with me as an organization 
I think that's the beauty of, of what technology like automation, AI, ML uh, can do. All right, let's explore uh, the network effect of simplifying this complexity, which segues nicely with the next segment of this conversation, which is instrumenting the change. And Tapan, uh, I'll come to you first. You know, how do you think change can be standardized to create maximum impact for a business, say yours, by bridging execution gaps when it comes to customer experience? And if you could give more details on how automation has enabled this transformation for you, we'll come to you first and then Rama. Okay, see, I think one of the ways that we went about change was uh, my um, statement to my uh, leader and my team was that uh, we should be making a difference to the industry. Uh, insurance has a bad name. I think when I look at customers across the world, nobody is excited, one, either to buy insurance or two, say that they had a great experience with insurance. And people take it for granted that this is how it will be. I said, no, this is not accepted. In the era when you had manual, you didn't have uh, phones with camera. You required surveys, you wanted physical you know, numerous documents, you had to access uh, uh, company records to figure things out, or you had to go to you know, repairer and you didn't have parts availability and all. That was fine, but in today's era, it is at your fingertips. So why would we actually you know, not uh, define the industry to a place where customers say that insurance is really very, very cool? You know, I think that was the first statement that we had. Now, how do we do that? So at all points, we would figure out that what automation will we do, what AI ML shall we put together, so that it's hyper speed. I think the problem with insurance claims is it takes too much time. You'll be surprised, just 20 years back, a car claim would take four months. Can you believe it today, just 20 years back, it would take four months and you have to carry salvage, parts, bumper, headlights to the insurance company, deposit it, take a claim? No, you laugh at it today, but it was just 20 years back, it was like that. And today I'm telling you, if you have an accident, get down on your car, claim, which is upload, in 20 minutes, we'll transfer money to your account. No? So I think mm. when you have all such availability, which is already there, and that is what excited, I think, my team, my people, and we said, yeah, we do that. Empathy, and I heard you say that how the chatbots will get empathy. I said, empathy is something which we can't be just leaving it to you know, machines. Uh, when somebody has a loss and you're suffering, empathy has to play a very big role. How do we bring it, the empathy part to the speech and even to bots? How do we take it to that level where a customer believes and feels that we are by that time? And if the automation is failing, how does the person come in and provide that support, empathy, and love to the customer in times of need. No, and how do we keep on building on that? So it's, it's not about one piece that we talk about. It's not about efficiency anymore. The era of efficiency in automation is over. I think that was, uh, I would say, is now 10 to 15 years back. The era of redefining an experience, bringing in the human element, you know, along with technology, solving industry issues to the next level is there. So it's, it's you as a leader have to have hyper requirement of all this. I think Rick will remember that we were on the first company ever time, and I think the large company, the first in the world to move our code to cloud, yeah? Uh, hmm. We said we'll move the code to cloud and people laughed at us. What, and people did not believe in cloud as such. I said, no, I think the era of having you no, know, uh, uh, all this is not required. And then we chose a particular partner simply because they had open end sources with a lot of entrepreneurs plugging and playing in that. Because then I felt I'm using hundreds of brains you know, to solve customer issues at a hyper scale and I get fast connect everywhere. And I think so putting all that together, you no, know, that is what the leadership vision and the passion will bring to you. And then your entire team gets aligned because we are not only just doing business, we're not only making return to shareholders, but we are defining the industry. We're creating a legacy for others to follow. I think when you read that stage, you know, Gautam, things become very, very easy. And, and you have Absolutely. to be really abreast and take those bets and, you know, place your um, thinking that this is how we shall win this. Absolutely. I think the conversation is now more on the human effect of automation. I think we are in that era. R uh, Rick, your response to uh, what Tapan said before I go to Rama, we are, he, those who invested in the human factor, they're having the last laugh. Well, I, I think that that's I, I think that that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think that automation is not about replacing human beings. It's about how do we emulate what they're what they're capable of doing and increasing their productivity and enabling them to focus on things that really matter to the business. And in this case, what matters to their end customers. I mean, I, I can just imagine what Toppin and Rama are looking at from their business business perspective every day, and they would much rather have their employees focusing on the end users, their customers, their partner ecosystem, and coming up with new creative ideas to take the industry forward as opposed to doing manual tasks. That's not something that any of us want to be able to help uh, and to help drive. So that's where 
you know, automation come in, that's where UiPath can come in. So I completely agree with what, what uh, Tapan was talking about. All right, Rama, what, would you like to add something to this about standardizing change to create maximum impact before we go into more specific use cases? Well, it's a really relevant point. As a technology company, we have been making investments, massive investments in uh, uh, data way uh, and improving the IT itself. And of course, investing we made very quickly in uh, automation space. Uh, a few examples like uh, we use RPA in a very, very big way. Uh, we know, like in a credit card industry, a uh, number of uh, examples will be the customer will come back, dispute a transaction. Uh, those in the email base used to be like a email based kind of process where a lot of manual involvement used to be there. A uh, lot of agents used to read it and then, based on their understanding, they used to pick up the next action. We were able to standardize the entire process using this RPA. Uh, you know, by creating a web form and stand, in, capturing the intent of the customer itself in a very, very standard way and then subjecting it to the next actions. This has released a lot of uh, uh, manpower, otherwise, it was used in Monday and uh, At the same time, you know, I mean, we, we are investing in manpower, and I'm not talking about release of manpower, I'm talking more about re engaging them or redeploying them in the uh, activity which will be beneficial to the customer. For example, in a great car industry, uh, which is a, a big intense competition scale. Uh, we have to engage with the customer. So we need to understand the person of the customer. So we invested very heavily in hyper-personalization kind of activities where we constantly look for uh, uh, data uh, transaction patterns, uh, the kind of behavior of the customer and the great persona, and make a right offer at a relevant time. Because uh, even if you make an offer, not through your right channel, but at a irrelevant time, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't translate into uh, business. Uh, so I can only say like you know, we are using the automation uh, to take care of the mundane and repetitive activities, but at the same time investing in more skilled manpower where it improves the uh, customer engagement and it is also all right. Let's expand on that point and I'll get your view on this Rama and Tapan as well. You both outline where automation currently is in your organization's value curve. But now, you know, how have you charted its improvement its in value towards the way you work in a more digitally enabled world? In the case of Bajaj Alliance, we've seen it speed up policy issuance, improve processing of hub data distribution and create robust quality checks. While in the instance of SBI cards, we've seen video, KYC, e-sign chatbots and other initiatives. So my question simply is what's next? Do you think say RPAs uh, will be the new ERP as they evolve to fulfill the same function? So we'll come to you Rama first on this and then Tapan's views. Uh, I think uh... Uh, use cases will definitely expand. I cannot say, like, I mean, sitting here, what will be the, how many more number of use cases will be there. Uh, but I can only give an example, like, uh, when we talk together within the company uh, and brainstorm, like, what more processes can be automated, uh, I mean, a process which is like a game, that is asset level key management, which is considered a kind of dreamy game, and then uh, uh, it is only like only selected people who can handle the tail and function, you may not believe, actually, we were able to use a bot. To minimize the manual interaction. So, uh, using a bot, we were able to source the information from multiple sources and compare it, figure out what are the changes in the cash flow, etc. With the manual involvement being limited to only where to keep the funds. That's all. So, uh, and I'm just quoting one example. Uh, no one would have thought of like a alien kind of function, which is a more of a uh, somebody has to think intelligently and then look at the policies, etc. Even that can be automated. Uh, then I, I don't think there is any limit. Uh, of course, it is a kind of acceptability within the company where uh, we have to demonstrate that actually it is not to take away any jobs or anything, but rather it is freeing the manpower from mundane activities so that they can focus uh, more on analytical work, uh, which will be more satisfaction also. To them. All right, Tapan, uh, your, the question to you, what's next? Uh, you know, as I asked, do you think RPAs will be the new ERP as they evolve to fulfill the same functions? What's your view on this? Brother, my RP also is old now. My view is very simple. Anything which does not require empathy, compassion, and love has to be automated. No, it is as simple as that. So we have to move to a stage that any kind of process, any kind of systems, no, it should be at hyper automated scale. Uh, connected to many data points, figuring out stuff, doing it things. Uh, the human angle has to be on empathy, care, and love and compassion. And that is the only thing we should not and cannot be automated till now. I think I don't know the future if it gets done, there's a different issue. 
But if it does not require empathy, care, compassion, love, should be automated. That is it. The human factor is always center for you when it comes to, you know, upcoming use cases. Fair point. So let's get an understanding of the broader lessons, the broader strategies when it comes to, say, devising or designing an automation journey. And Rick, I'll come to you for this. You know, what are the defining characteristics of a robust automation journey or framework no matter say which industry or geography and enterprise comes from and in your opinion how should leaders measure its impact in the right way yeah it's a great question i think what we typically see is that the best in class organizations across industry doesn't matter the industry really take a four pillar approach to have the greatest impact when it comes to their automation journey so first they assign all automatable work to software robots to make back office work invisible. And that's what you just heard from Toppin. Secondly, they provide a robot for every person in the company, right? Third, they're democratizing development so that power users can quickly build new automations and applications. And we call that citizen development. So as opposed to having to go to a select group within the organization, we find more and more organizations asking us to asking us or our partners to train and enable their line of business owners and the folks that are in the business to become citizen developers to create automatable work there. And then finally, we're finding that they're applying AI to every facet of work. So they're expanding the footprint of automation into cognitive processes. So as, as Top is talking about around empathy, about love, we're not there yet, but we may get there in the future. So thinking about how do you automate into cognitive processes, which leads to even more automation within an organization. Now, what we're finding and how it's measured, automation helps companies across four key areas that leaders, so CEOs like, like the gentleman on this, on this meeting can track and measure. And these four areas across the following. One, it enables them to accelerate growth and operational efficiency. Two, minimize risk and ensure compliance and operations, which is critical. We absolutely have to make sure that you're at in compliance. Three, improve customer experience. And finally, increase employee engagement. And when you combine all that together, you can have a great experience with automation. All right, Anil, coming to you, I'm building on the point which Rick mentioned about empowering everyone. How do you align automation with big data to extract the most value for powering insights that could grow a business? Because value at the end of the day is the name of the game. You know, how can issues around organizational alignment, business processes, change management, communications and skill sets and resistance to change be solved in that context. Yeah, so you make a very good point, Gautam. I think first data, both structured and unstructured has increased exponentially, right? In the last decade or so. And so the software tools we invented to manage actually have multiplied, especially with cloud becoming the norm. An average large global enterprise is supporting roughly around 1,200 cloud-based applications, right, at any given point of time. So I think from our standpoint, automation, working with, uh, you know, looking at data analytics, AI, ML, is supposed to make this work easier, to make, uh, you know, life of the, uh, uh, the end users or the customers within the uh, organization much more easier. And so therefore, we need to make sure that we deploy automation in a fashion where you're absolutely bringing intelligence, like I said, the right intelligence for the right personas, making sure that they are much more empowered to make decisions. We have what is called human in the loop, right? So you need to insert humans at an appropriate point in time, should not just be automation for the sake of automation. How do you build that model where you bring the humans in the loop where you want to also look at uh, validating whatever decisions has been made through automation, whether they are really there, build in the empathy factor uh, that, people, that I think Tapan was talking about, and the ability for us to kind of build this seamlessly across all, uh, you know, sub functions within the organization, because it is very easy, we could become very siloed even in automation, right? So how do you kind of build a seamless framework? I think Rick talked about the fully automated enterprise that f goes from function to function, and then you still ex extract data and analytics out of it to make or help make uh, decisions for the organization. I mean, just think of it, I mean, today, we are ordering food uh, or we kind of call a taxi on just a click of a, uh, a button in an application, right? And you kind of get the end-to-end -end, uh, automation done. I think we can do the same over here. So the idea is, again, automation should marry legacy with next generation technologies, mm -hmm. right? Processes, 
it should get simplification right so you kind of simplify the processes also i think we should just make sure that we should also have a mechanism to even validate that the current set of processes can they be structured differently so automation should not just be done for the heck of it we must also question whether the current set of processes in itself can we reengineer them to make uh, you know life of the organization much better so it does involve processes change management communications you rightly talked about skill sets because again we have this citizen developer program where you want the ideas to come from the people on the ground they should come back on a daily basis saying hey i think this can be automated right this is a great idea that's how you kind of break the resistance to change the democratization of data is key i want to build on that it's a very interesting point and i want to build it up to you know when do you bring in automation into the loop and how do you democratize it i'll come to tapan and rick uh, for this tapan you you've always focused on the human factor but as the talent model itself transforms in this work from home era how do you determine when process workflows affecting personal productivity are ripe for automation you know do you think giving employees the tool to automate themselves is, a, is in a way that you know a solution that works best you know how do how do you see this working for large enterprise okay so i think the challenge here is you now if you look at and think about it, it looks pretty easy you know that people would automate and they would come out with solutions and say yeah we can automate this the problem is the moment people think of automating it they are at the back of the mind of thinking will i lose my job you know mm. so i think the challenge is not about what can be automated and who starts it the challenge is more about the fun of going to the next level that if you automate something then you actually move on to a higher job and you move to the next level of job and how do as an enterprise and organization they're able to keep the excitement of new avenues new jobs and keep your people challenged that is where the challenge comes for leaders it is not about simple automation which is there no now when you develop a culture like this in which we say that the more you automate the more faster you grow in the company and the more responsible you get because i think i remember one of my talks in one of the town halls one employee asked me that we hear so much of ai ml and no uh, will we lose our job and what do you think so i told the person that the only person who i believe will never lose his job is the one who can find solutions to problems i think no if you are the leader to find solutions to problems and you're excited about it your job is always there with any organization requires such people if you have empathy love and compassion no as integral part of your dna you'll never lose your job so i think the fundamental issue is that if you can excite your people that the more they automate the faster they move up and the more into problem solving no Uh, positions which they get, which obviously pays well and gives you, you no know, better uh, recognition in the organization. I think then the automation starts happening at a hyper speed. Because as you rightly heard just now, like, no, no, I think uh, bots, um, RPAs, they are prevalent. So people do a lot of manual work and they can automate it. You have uh, people with Six Sigma, you have all these heads in processes automation who you know keep on looking at this on a piecemeal basis. Till your front end employee is excited to automate his job and make himself redundant. Till that time, you not build a culture in which automation will happen at hyper speed. I think that is my take on this. All right, Rick, your response to it: Do you think giving employees the tools to automate themselves is, say, the best solution in the circumstances? While there might be initial resistance, they do we will realize the value that it brings to the table, and then come on board and discover a new way of working itself and enhancing themselves as well. Uh, absolutely you see that within organizations you see that in governments looking to upskill the citizenry you know automation today helps address the problem of proliferation and fragmentation of applications that we've seen over the last decade or so you know the number of applications an average knowledge worker uses in their job no matter the function has grown exponentially now i know many of you are nodding at this because i have it in my day day to day you know top top and rama and neil got to you do as well you multiply that by the thousands of employees we engage with our employees are spending more and more time juggling between all of these applications and this has a direct correlation to productivity to workforce engagement and overall job satisfaction so all of these are areas that a ceo or the board would be interested in how do you solve for that and not a, as well as on top of what topin was just talking about now for us the vision for automation is to emulate human beings at a user interface layer and intuitively work as a user would so you add to this the no code low code low code approach to development and which is empowering the su that subject matter experts are able to build the utilities without having to reach out to a technical expert every single time this promises to bridge the gap that has existed for a long time within organizations 
And, th and, and I can give you an example of this. So within a function that we have called Studio X, it's a simple drag and drop functionality that anyone can use, right? And what's amazing is when I talk to a candidate about coming to join UiPath, I get them to sign up for a, a, a free trial and they can start to leverage their own Studio X capabilities and they're doing their drag and drop capabilities. And within you know a few hours, they've already set up their own bot. Now that's the power of automation. And I, and I do firmly believe to what Top is talking about, when you unleash that creativity, you're gonna have a lot happier employee base. Well, it's a DIY world. Uh, let's see what Rama has to say. Rama, you've heard Rick uh, outline, you know, how things are progressing. And from your instance, as the talent pool widens, how do, in your opinion, do you ensure automation tools are intuitive and familiar to those who are using it? You know, how do you see it bridging the gap between a digital and non-digital native workforce, especially as, say, operation expands into tier two, tier three, tier four areas? Yeah, I mean, first of all, in my industry, which is dominated by a lot of fintech companies, we are seeing intensified competition. It is the customer and the customer experience which will demand whether we have to automate the particular process or not. So, the kind of consumer compliance that we receive, etc., that will automatically you know, it can provide insights whether a particular process, whether that's a manual intervention, is leading to more others, whether there is a possibility of automation or not. So, that, that, that's a driver. Uh, so, we look at it and then we automate it and we train the people uh, in using those automated tools. But at the same time, we also use the automation for market expansion and for growth. So, to just address the other point of human I mean, employee concerns around the uh, uh, possibility of losing job or not, uh, it is more around how you are using this automation for expanding the market share. For example, I will give an example. We have a significant uh, uh, number of people who are new to credit who may not have uh, the thick file in the bureau. Typically, a card company will only look at a bureau score, a table address, and a score card, and they card the customer. But for a customer who is new to the new to credit, obviously, you have to use so much of the big data, uh, uh, they, they study the profile, study the digital footprint, and consume it in terms of underwriting and digital capability. So, automation definitely, I mean, uh, uh, one hand, we, we continuously we have to look at opportunities to automate, we have to train the manpower, but at the same time, use it for expansion. Uh, I'm to, uh, the All right, let me get Anil's take on this as well to kind of wrap up this segment around instrumenting of change. Anil, from the many clients that UiPi works with, you know, what are the lessons learned when it comes to bridging the gap between a digital and non-digital native workforce? How can automation help there? Yeah, it's a great question, Gautam, and just sticking on from what Rick said, right? I think we are investing our time and effort to skill developers at one end, but I think it's equally important for us to kind of build this skill at the business users. So we are doing this in parallel, building knowledge with the business users in parallel, uh, whether it's through our academy or through our certification programs, regular meetups, workshops, and all of that. Because I think the more uh, knowledgeable uh, the, the workforce is, like I said, that much more easier in terms of uh, adoption of change re re related to uh, you know automation. I'll give a simple example, and I'm, I'm using this as an example because I think it is also uh, that we have to lead by example as leaders. So all of my weekly sales forecast calls and the reports that I have, I just trigger a bot, right? And the bot will come back and give me exactly what I need in the way I need. So everything that I need from a forecasting perspective, whether it's pipeline, whether it's you know deals that are there that I need to close business that's out there, all of that is very easily available to me in a very uh, easy to consume format, right? What I've also done is I've made this change down to my leadership level where they do the same, right? What this helps is we are now using data analytics to study behaviors and figure out what can we do to uh, make the decisions that we make much more intelligent uh, so it's really about building a smarter workforce, not getting them work for 14, 18 hours, right? So uh, more in less time is what I'm saying. I think, so for us, it's it's really about this adoption of change and it has to be a cultural change. Uh, you have to understand technology is now part of our life. It will continue to be as, uh, as prevalent as it has been. And I think automation for me is the fourth irreversible trend, right? You had globalization, you had digitization, you had mobility. In time, we will never go back. Automation is here to stay. 
I think it's it's that cultural shift, as I just talked about, looking at internal use cases that will really help uh, bridge this uh, divide. I, I I think it's a no option if you ask me, Gautam. All right. It's interesting to know, Anil, to use an Iron Man reference. You have your very own Jarvis to help you work. Uh, but uh, that's the future. And talking about the future, let's also understand how we can inspire the change to kind of wrap up the conversation. And uh, let me come to Tapan and Rama for their views on what are some of the changes that they would like to see in terms of, say, automation capabilities to make it more accessible and inclusive. Tapan, we'll come to you first and then to Rama. I think we have I heard uh, Rick you know, and Anil speak about, I think the empowering of the front end to be able to automate and to be excited about it is the next uh, frontier. I think the more and uh, the hyperspeed at which you reach at, then innovation would have an exponential growth from what it is. I've always believed that innovation is not the uh, custody of some innovate, innovation head or some, some team in an organization. It, it should be with every everybody at the front end. So I think the more empowering happen at the front end, the more excited they are, and the more they are aligned to the vision of transforming the industry of getting customer experience to a level where the customer has not even thought about. I think that is where the game is now, and that is where no the future mm. would be. All right, an increased role in the front end. That's what Tapan sees. Rama, what's your view? Some changes that you'd like to see in terms of automation capabilities to make it more accessible and inclusive? Uh, definitely between the organization. We need to acquire that kind of capabilities to implement these uh, automation processes. Uh, train the people, particularly uh, we may have to upskill and uh, train the existing manpower in terms of using the tools. Uh, so it will call for a kind of a comprehensive plan within the company uh, in terms of what skill gap is there and uh, how do we train the existing manpower to adopt and use the tools that are convenient. All right, convenience of the consumer, that's paramount. Let's take this conversation to the home stretch. And for this, I'll come to first Anil and then uh, sum it up with Rick's views. Anil, how do you see the automation redefining customer experience journeys as newer use cases emerge with more digital connectivity? You know, what lessons can the world learn from India? And we'll come to Rick for the lessons that the that India can learn from the world. Yeah, I think first, and foremost, Gautam, in my mind, we have to, at a leadership level, take a call on whether automation is a strategic business enabler or is it a tactical necessity? Because I think emanating from that mindset, I think we have an enormous opportunity uh, to support companies of all sizes, uh, you know, make them best in class. And, and obviously, it's all about being competitive, superior, not just for the local markets, globally as well, right? I'm mm. obviously pretty passionate about India. And for me, leveraging technology to services uh, to service the need, uh, you know, to every Indian organization or multinational organization efficiently and effectively is is the mantra that we follow, right? I also believe we have the talent, the willingness. We've got the use cases uh, that we can create an impact uh, for for just not uh, our organization for the world globally. So again, just quoting examples, right? Uh, when we talk about change and we're talking about business outcomes i'll give you another example i quoted about this contact center this is a customer of ours the average call time was 18 to 20 minutes just the experience from a customer standpoint using automation bringing just these disparate islands of uh, you know the sources of information that we could pull for that particular customer we reduced that time to half just imagine and multiply this by the number of customers if you've got a million customers just take that and that experience led to half a billion dollars of, uh, you know, savings. Uh, and I'm talking about the uh, revenue growth, which obviously I'm not going to quote over here. But essentially, this is a good example of how if you were to think differently and make mm. automation as a strategic business enabler, we can transform our businesses completely. The way we think, the way we think about our organization, our people, we can change this completely. And that's, I think, what automation or intelligent automation can do. It's also about how we think. Are we thinking about this as a product or a platform? Because I do believe at UiPath, being a platform company, our vision to kind of handhold some of these companies to transition them into the next generation as a strategic business is, is key for us. And that's what uh, you know, we bring to the table. All right. I believe Rama also has an interesting uh, uh, example when it comes to a use case of the point that you are illustrating when it comes to empowering employees. Rama? Yeah. In fact, uh, Dr. Uh, good 
we are not only using EA and automation for automating the processes, but we, are, we have developed a tool, a chatbot called Bristy, which is a knowledge bot uh, for the benefit of the uh, employees. Uh, it is deployed in the uh, telecalling centers where once the call is in, the telecalling agent actually categorizes the nature of the complaint. The bot actually prompts the agent as to what questions to ask, what information to ask, and it even helps in fulfilling the transaction. So uh, it has become very popular. You know, like in the absence of such kind of bots, they have to uh, recall a kind of SOP from the system. They have to read through, and then it will be a very lengthy part. So now the calculations have come down. The customer experience is also better. And uh, uh, since that kind of scores, what we track from the customers, they have improved actually after the introduction of the knowledge bot. Indeed, the possibilities are limitless and the value is immense. Uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. So, Rick, I'll come to you to wrap up the conversation. Your summary statement on how you see automation redefining the customer experience journey as uh, newer use cases emerge with more digital connectivity. And more importantly, what lessons say the world can the world learn from India and vice versa? Yeah, look, I mean, Asia has been home to me for, for 18 years. And, you know, India has been one of my favorite destinations to, to travel to. I've, I've spent more than, I've gone to India more than 120 times uh, and cannot wait for the borders to reopen. And, and Neil knows this, one of my big mantras is, how do we lead the world from APJ, from Asia Pacific and Japan? And, you know, all the, the, the few use cases we've talked about today, we're seeing the prevalence of this more and more across uh, Asia Pacific and Japan, and, and Neil's really starting to activate that in India. And we're seeing this demand really accelerate uh, in the subcontinent. And, you know, as, as intelligent automation takes over the workload of processes, it gives back time for every constituent of a business to listen to their customers with empathy, as we heard with, from Toppin, solve their problems, and deliver an exceptional experience. And that's really critical. And a, and a good example I'll leave you with is, a chatbot integration that we've seen from an insurance company in Singapore. They've integrated a chatbot with intelligent automation to process customer insurance claims in real time. And then that's vital not only in COVID times, but when hopefully we come out of this stronger than ever. And if we're able to do that, that's going to give confidence back not only to our employees, but to our end customers, which are our most vital resource. All right, on that note, it's time to wrap up this special presentation titled Forbes India, Influencers of Change in Partnership with UiPath. I'd like to thank everyone on the panel for sharing their lessons and insights on innovating the right way for the future. This is Gautam Srinivasan signing off. Forbes India, Influencers of Change in Partnership with UiPath. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.